Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Modeling Subject-Specific Femoral Torsion for the Analysis of Lower Limb Joint Loads. My name is Christopher Iverson, and I work here at Anybody Technology. Today, I will be the host of this webinar, and I will be joined by my colleague, Paul Galibero, who is one of our senior consultants here at Anybody Technology. And Paul will join us during the Q&A session and help us out with answering your questions. In today's webcast, we have an external speaker who is Dr. Enrico Di Pieri, who is currently working as a research associate at the University of Basel Children's Hospital in Switzerland. Enrico is going to give his presentation in a minute or so. But just before we start, I will give you a general introduction and overview of the antibody modeling system. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling and simulations in general. So let's begin with having a look at what the antibody modeling system actually is. The antibody modeling system is a software that allows you to, mus to do musculoskeletal modeling and simulations. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates the internal body loads as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And down here in the bottom of the screen, you can see a screenshot from the software, which can give you an idea of how the system actually looks. At the moment, anybody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications. And a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports optimization, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices as, for example, an exoskeleton. And the typical workflow in anybody could look something like this. So you provide the recorded motion data as input, and then you use the body models which you or others have built. And then you provide some kind of environment, which could be a special type of equipment or, for example, an exoskeleton. You can then use anybody to combine these things and solve the muscle recruitment and run the inverse dynamic simulations. This basically means that we go from motion to calculate the internal body loads and the interaction with the environment in some cases. And the simulation could look something like this. You can then output the results and use it for post-processing with, for example, some kind of finite element tool. But many users also choose to close the loop completely by doing some kind of design optimization and then run this cycle multiple times. This actually brings me to the end of the introduction, and I will hand over the word and present the role to Enrico instead. Yeah, thanks, first of all, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. So in today's webcast, I will first give a brief introduction about lower limb alignment, joint loads, and load-induced pathologies, and also discuss why we need more personalized models to investigate these conditions. I will then cover a few examples. First of all, I will show how femoral torsion can affect the resulting hip loads in a group of healthy adults. Then I will present how we can currently try to investigate joint loads in pathological populations. I will then show you how we're trying to incorporate these tools in our routine clinical practice at the children's hospitals here in Basel. And at the end of this webinar, I will give a demonstration of how you could also personalize your own models in the anybody modeling system. But let's get started by talking about load-induced joint pathologies, and specifically about osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis consists in a deterioration and subsequent loss of articular cartilage. It affects also all the surrounding structures in the joint, determining, for instance, periarticular bone remodeling and muscle weaknesses. While some biological factors can predispose to osteoarthritis, its onset is almost always caused by increased physical forces uh, causing tissue damage. Increased localized forces in the joints can be due to abnormal anatomy, which leads uh, to increased local stresses in specific regions of the joint. It can also occur as a consequence of an excessive overall load, which might occur as a result of a chronic repetitive overload, such as those associated with demanding occupational tasks or obesity. But it can also occur as a consequence of sudden acute loads, for instance, associated with an injury or a trauma. However, this increase in forces is often determined by a combination of both factors. Joint malalignment is a common example of how these factors come into play leading to localized excessive loads and damage to the articular cartilage. For instance, knee varus alignment is associated with the onset of knee osteoarthritis, 
and particularly with an increased force in the middle compartment of the knee, causing localized damage to the cartilage on the middle side. However, knee virus or vargus alignment are not the only type of malalignment which are thought to cause an increase of the loads in the lower limb. Other abnormalities in the morphology of the musculoskeletal system, such as flat feet deformities or rotation of the tibia and the femur, can lead to a series of postural and kinematic adaptation and potentially overloads throughout the musculoskeletal system. The effect of malalignment doesn't only span multiple joints, but it also manifests itself across different anatomical planes. Due to this, this complex interplay, understanding the effect of malalignment on joint loads can be quite challenging. We are particularly interested in understanding the effect of femoral torsional alignment. Femoral torsion is defined as the angle between the femoral neck axis and the axis connecting the posterior uh, contour of the femoral condyles in the transversal plane. There is quite some variability across the population. Children normally present a large femoral torsion of approximately 40 degrees, which spontaneously resolves with growth and stabilizes at around 15 degrees during adulthood. There are also some additional differences associated with sex, with females presenting larger torsion compared to males. These are all understood to be normal variations of the normal human anatomy. However, in some cases, uh, increased torsion can persist during adulthood. Large deviations are usually considered abnormal. However, there's no consistent definition of what should be deemed as excessive femoral torsion, with different references values ranging between 30 and 50 degrees. On the other side of the distribution, also retrotorsion is considered pathological, as it can lead to different types of complications. Excessive femoral torsion can affect muscle functionality by reducing the convenience of the lever arm of a given muscle, and more specifically, of the hip abductors, during a specific motion, such as gait. This is referred to as lever arm dysfunction, which in turn can lead to kinematic compensatory mechanisms, such as in towing gait pattern. By internally rotating the hip and the overall leg, the moment arms of the hip adductors muscles are increased, or at least restored to more normal values. Additionally, the antetort femoral head is guided directly into the acetabulum. So torsion and malalignment of both femur and tibia can lead to issues in terms of muscle functionality and in terms of cosmesis of gait, as some patients can be disturbed by their evident in towing gait pattern. However, torsion and alignment is also known to be associated with joint pain at several levels with also the increased risk for hip dislocation and with recurrent patellar instabilities. So this is not just a, a functional and a cosmetic issue, but potentially also a problem of altered joint loading. One treatment option for torsional malalignment is a derotation osteotomy. This is a rather invasive surgery in which the bone is literally cut and then fixated back into the desired position. In the case of idiopathic torsional deformities, meaning in case of deformities which are not due to any other known underlying pathology, the decision on whether to operate or not is not so straightforward. For these kind of patients, there's not a general consensus regarding the indication for surgery, which is normally performed when the patient is symptomatic, but often the final decision also lies within the experience of the clinician. Furthermore, there's not really a consensus regarding which biomedical parameters could be used to quantify the, this need for surgery, nor to quantify the expected targeted outcomes, which, for instance, could be the joint kinematics and the appearance of the gait pattern, or a purely geometrical description of muscle lever arms and muscle functionality, or a restoration of normal joint loading. These are all questions that we can address through musculoskeletal modeling. But in order to understand the effect of femoral torsion on all these parameters, we need to make sure we take into account information regarding not only subject-specific morphometry and anatomy, but also about subject-specific kinematics and the way these patients move. In order to account for subject-specific morphology, we will need subject-specific models of the subjects we're actually analyzing. Subject-specific models can be built from CT or MRI data, However, this imaging data is not always available, 
And additionally, building these models from imaging is a rather time consuming process, characterized by some difficulties and uncertainties, such as in the definition of the muscle's lines of action. On the other hand, generic models are ready to use and well established models. However, their geometry is based on a single cadaveric specimen. And for this reason, they cannot be considered representative of the overall population, let alone other pathological cases. For instance, in the case of the TLM 2.0 cadaveric dataset, the bone morphology was obtained from a single cadaveric male specimen. We had a look at it more in detail, and we found a torsion of approximately five degrees. When we contextualize this torsional value with some of the values I mentioned before, we can understand that this generic model is not a good representation of the pathological subjects and probably not even a good representative for the variability that we observe in the overall healthy population either. For this reason, we decided to develop some personalized models that would account for these variations in torsional alignment. And we did this by taking the femoral geometry of the generic model TLM 2.1, and we morphed it by rotating the distal and the proximal section of the femurs so that it could match a desired femoral torsion value for a specific subject. This morphing tool will be incorporated in the next release of the antibody model repositories. And I will give you a short demonstration at the end of this webcast also. But first, I would like to show you why this is important to account for femoral torsion in the analysis of joint loads. For this purpose, I will present you the results of a study which was carried out as a collaboration between ATH Zurich and the Schultes Clinic. Our focus was specifically on the hip, and we wanted to evaluate hip kinematics and kinetics, muscle forces, and hip contact forces occurring during gait in a group of asymptomatic adults that presented a heterogeneous range of femoral torsion. In order to answer these questions, we build personalized musculoskeletal models based on subject-specific motion capture and radiographic data. For this study, we recruited 37 healthy volunteers who did not present any back or lower extremity pain or injury, nor a history of previous hip surgeries. We acquired low dosage by playing our radiographs of the lower limb with the EOS system, and we assessed their femoral torsion based on the three-dimensional reconstruction of their femur. In this cohort of volunteers, the femoral torsion values range from seven degrees of retrotorsion to 38 degrees of antitorsion, with the mean values of 16 degrees. The participants underwent three-dimensional gait analysis, and we acquired kinematic and kinetic data for stat for a static standing reference trial and for three to five gate trials at a self-selected gate speed. We use this data as an input for an inverse dynamic analysis in the antibody modeling system. In order to generate personalized musculoskeletal models, we scale the generic model to match the overall anthropometrics of the subjects, as well as the markers data acquired during the reference standing trial. We then further included additional measurements that were obtained from the radiographic images, such as the distance between hip joint centers as a reference to scale the pelvic width. Finally, we morphed the geometry of the femurs, as I explained before, in order to match the torsional value of the specific subject. When morphing the geometry of the femur, the lines of action of the muscles attached to it also follow this morphing. As you can see in the example here on the right side, an antitorsion of 45 degrees leads to some alter muscles line of action throughout the lower limb. For this reason, we perform a qualitative evaluation of the lever arms of the hip muscles for different values of femoral torsion. So we evaluated the muscle lever arms over arbitrary ranges of motion. As you can see in this example, the lever arms of the hip adductors are evaluated for three different torsional configurations. We can qualitatively observe that the lever arms of the hip adductors tend to decrease with a higher femoral torsion. However, if we introduce an initial internal rotation of the hip of approximately 20 degrees, we can see that the lever arm of the hip adductors are increased and the overall abductive capacity of this muscle is restored. This confirms that a compensatory mechanism, such as hip internal rotation and in towing, can indeed mitigate the lever arm dysfunction of the hip abductors. Coming back to the gait data that was acquired from our healthy volunteers, 
we proceeded uh, we, uh, to process all the data with any Py tools. In particular, we investigated hip rotations, foot progression angle, hip internal net moments, muscle forces, and hip contact forces. We explore potential correlations between femoral torsion and any of these variables through statistical parametric mapping. We use canonical correlation analysis for any of these quantities that could be considered as a multidimensional vector field, while we use regression analysis for individual scalar components. When we look at the correlation between femoral torsion and the overall hip three-dimensional kinematics, we found a correlation in the transition between stance and swing phase. When looking at the postdoc analysis of the individual hip kinematic components, we can see that there is actually a negative correlation between femoral torsion and hip external rotation. We then look at the foot progression angle and found a positive correlation with femoral torsion in late stance. When looking at the kinetics, we did not find any correlation between femoral torsion and the net hip internal moments. Coming to the muscle forces, we found a correlation between torsion and the forces produced by the hip abductor compartment as a whole, during late stance and during swing phase. When looking at the postdoc analysis, we can see that this correlation is mostly due to the gluteus minimus, which is negatively correlated with femoral torsion during swing phase. We also found correlation between femoral torsion and all the other hip muscle compartments, such as hip adductors, hip flexors, and hip extensors. We then calculated the resulting hip contact forces and expressed them in a pelvis space reference frame according to ISP standards. The hip contact forces were also correlated with femoral torsion in our cohort. In particular, subjects with a higher antitorsion presented more medially and more anteriorly oriented hip contact forces. Finally, we evaluated the differences in joint prediction when using generic and personalized models. We observed statistically significant differences in force prediction throughout the gait cycle when using one set of models or the other. What is also important to highlight is that the difference in predicted forces between the two models increase for higher values of torsion indicating that the more the alignment of a subject deviates from the generic model, the more important it is to use personalized models in order to obtain an accurate prediction of joint loads. So to summarize the, the findings of this study, we observed that femoral torsion can affect the muscle lever arms and therefore can also have an influence on muscle recruitment and muscle force generation. Some kinematic compensatory mechanisms, such as hip internal rotation, can restore the lever arm capacity. In our cohort of healthy adults, we observe correlations between femoral torsion and both hip and foot kinematics, indicating that some sort of compensatory mechanism may already be in place. We also observe a correlation between torsion and hip contact forces. Within the, this context, it becomes clear that for an accurate analysis of joint loads, we should account for both subject-specific kinematics and morphological features. The use of personalized models led to significantly different joint loading predictions. This is particularly important when the subject-specific morphology largely deviates from the baseline model. Morphing femoral geometry in the generic model is a quick and effective solution, which can be performed from low-dosage low imaging data, as I showed you in our example, but also from values obtained through physical examination. Femoral torsion is just one of the many parameters that can affect the overall hip mechanics. The femoral neck shaft angle, for instance, could similarly affect muscle lever arms and the resulting joint loads. Additionally, there are some other clinically relevant parameters, such as acetabular coverage, acetabular retroversion, and the presence of CAM and pincer deformities that could lead to overall kinematic and kinetic deviations, such as in the case of pain avoidance. These parameters could also affect the contact mechanics and the load distribution within the joint. And I would like to show you a quick example of how we could investigate the load distribution within the acetabulum. We took the hip contact force vector and intersected it with a hemisphere representing an idealized acetabulum, 
which was characterized by 45 degrees of inclination and 20 degrees of version. We then plotted this, uh, the, this intersection as a contact force pathway, as you can see here. And across the cohort that we analyzed, the loads during gait are mostly transmitted from the femur to the anterior superior lateral quad quadrant of this idealized acetabulum. Now, when we look into the literature, it is reported that in patients affected by femoral acetabular impingement, there is a high incidence of peripheral cartilage lesions in the anterior and in the superior lateral regions. A subject-specific analysis of the load distribution, accounting also for subject-specific acetabular morphology, may help identify in patients who present peripheral joint loading and for this reason are at higher risk for articular cartilage damage. Chem and pincer deformities are particularly important in the description of pathological hip mechanics. This type of morphological deviations is linked directly to femoral acetabular impingement syndrome and to the secondary onset of hip osteoarthritis. Alignment parameters such as femoral torsion could also play a role in this process, for instance, by aggravating the effect of existing chem and pincer deformities or by affecting the impingement free range of motion of the hip. My collaborators at the Schultes Clinic are currently planning to further analyze the hip loads experienced in patients with femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, while accounting for all the relevant morphological and kinematic characteristics. In terms of kinematics, in addition to normal gait, we're also planning to extend the analysis to a range of different uh, uh, set of activities of daily living, such as running, sitting down on a chair, and climbing upstairs. But also, more challenging tasks may be better suited at differentiating between normal and pathological hip mechanics. For this reason, the analysis will also cover activities such as pivot turns, but also drop jumps and lateral side hops. At the same time, together with the researchers from the St. Gallen Children's Hospital, we're planning to apply our methodology to a cohort of 42 pediatric and adolescent patients that present idiopathic CT-confirmed increased femoral torsion larger than 30 degrees. In addition to the hip loads, we will also expand our analysis to knee and patellar loads. And we will also further explore the relationships between their specific gait patterns and muscle functionality. We're also investigating how different surgical treatments can affect joint loading at the knee in collaboration with the University Hospital in Basel. In particular, we're investigating the effect of high tibial osteotomy, a surgical procedure that aims at realigning the tibia in order to reduce the loads in the medial compartment of the knee associated with the virus alignment. We analyzed the pre- and post-operative data of these patients I confirmed that this procedure reduces the compressive forces in the middle compartment without overloading the lateral one. Torsional alignment may also have a role on the onset of various overuse injuries, such as osgood schlatter and Seppers disease. We just recently worked on a literature review on this topic, which will soon be available online. And finally, I would like to show you how we're incorporating musculoskeletal modeling into our routine clinical analysis to better inform clinicians about the joint loads which are experienced by patients with malalignment. I will present you the results for a patient who visited our gate lab here at the Children's Hospital in Basel. The 15 years old patient seeked orthopedic consultation at our hospital due to a lingering bilateral knee pain. Upon further examination, a bilateral knee valgus, more pronounced on the left side, was diagnosed. The MRI confirmed bilateral femoral retrotorsion, which was also associated with a restricted range of internal hip rotation, particularly on the left side. The torsion of the tibia was within normative values. And with all these values in mind, we build our own personalized models that account for the malalignment of this patient. The gait pattern of this patient was also characterized by some peculiar characteristics, such as a forefoot contact, hyperextension of the knee, mostly on the left side, a frontal knee valgus alignment, externally rotated hip, again more pronounced on the left side, and externally rotated feet. 
we analyzed these joint loads by means of musculoskeletal modeling and found that the hip contact forces acting on his left acetabulum were more superiorly oriented at our normative values. At the knee level, the patient also presented an overload of the lateral compartment, more pronounced again on the left side. The final decision was to proceed first with a conservative treatment through the use of insoles. And this was an attempt to try to improve his knee alignment and his gait pattern first. This decision was based on the complete clinical picture of the patient. So I don't think that we can yet use musculoskeletal modeling as a diagnostic tool, nor to prescribe a, a specific type of treatment. However, it allowed the clinicians to have a better understanding of the mechanical pictures and of the loading situation at the joints of this patient. And it clearly gave us some indications on the fact that the health state of both the hip and the knee should be constantly monitored in the upcoming future. So to wrap everything up, limb alignment plays an important role in the mechanics of the lower limb, as it affects the loads from the foot all the way up to the spine. Joint loads are influenced by both anatomy and motion. For this reason, we need to account for all the relevant morphological parameters and include them in our models. This is relevant both for healthy and pathological subjects. Model personalization through geometrical morphing is an effective method to incorporate torsional alignment into our models. I would like to thank Morten, who helped me a lot actually in the development of such morphing tools, but also my, all my colleagues from the Children's Hospital in Basel and all the collaborators in the projects I presented today. Finally, I would like to thank the University of Basel for its financial support. And now I would like to show you how we can actually personalize our own models in anybody. So as I mentioned before, this torsional tool will be incorporated in the upcoming uh, MMR release, but you can already download it as part of the beta version. And the online, you can already find the documentation of the model, which uh, describes exactly how this torsional tool works and how the torsion is implemented while providing some of the relevant information. I will then jump straight into the into anybody modeling software to show you the example. So once we load this model, you can see that this torsional tool is applied to our standing model, the default standing model. And this is literally done just by including a few lines of code. This is actually the line of code that allows to incorporate this torsional tool. And what it takes as an input is a couple of parameters, which you can conveniently define into the model anthropometrics. And these are the nominal values of the femoral torsion you would like to implement in the model. Now, when we look at the rendering of the model, you can see here in green, the old original geometry of the femur of the TLM 2.0 cadaveric dataset. And in yellow is the new morph model that we're currently implementing our model. Now, the way this morphing tool works is actually by defining a box, a bounding box around the knee joint and another one around the hip joint. And literally what it does is introducing a twist in the torsional plane that allows to, uh, to account for this uh, femoral torsion and distributes it along the femoral shaft. You can see also how quickly it is to just like change some parameters. So if we try to actually model some extreme torsion and reload the model, you will notice immediately how the rendering adapts and how much the, the newly defined geometry is deviating from the original one of the model. So again, this gives you a visual impression of why it's important to account for these personalized parameters. When we actually open the, um, the utility toolbox, you can see that you can quickly turn on and off the morphine for the left or the right side. And when you open the control code, you can find all the definition of how this uh, uh, distortional tool is implemented. What is also quite useful is actually the, the rendering of the two reference frames, one aligned with the femoral neck axis and one aligned with the posterior con contour of the condyles of the femur. And uh, the offset between these two um, reference frames is basically the, the, desire, the torsional values that we have implemented in our model. 
Now, what I would also like to show you is that if we actually turn on the muscles on the model, you can also appreciate how the muscle muscles line of actions are altered when we introduce this morphine uh, of the femur. And you can see here, let me just hide this quickly, how the newly implemented uh, geometry of the femur is, is still currently attached to all the muscles. And you can see where the original position of the femur uh, was. So you can imagine basically that all the hip adductors muscle basically just follow the, uh, the newly defined torsional geometry. And so you're free to actually download this, uh, this toolbox as part of the beta version, or just wait for the next release into the anybody modeling uh, main, uh, repositories, and feel free to use it and play with it. I think it's quite an important feature, and the, the same uh, methodology could also be applied to other segments or to other planes. So it's really quite a useful tool also to try to, uh, to take the same morph uh, morphing approach and apply to the tibia, for instance, or to the upper body. And with this, I'm actually at the end. I would like to thank all of you for your attentions, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much for the presentation, Enrico. Uh, we are already starting to get a few questions, but uh, just before we go to the Q&A session, I would like to say a few words on how to get the femoral torsion tool. You already mentioned a bit of it, but I will just show a few slides we made. Yeah, so as you already mentioned, Enrico, the tool will be included as a new example in the Anybody Managed Model Repository, and it will be included uh, with the next release of Anybody. And we do not know the exact date for this yet, but it will probably be in two to four months. And if there is sitting uh, anyone out there who is uh, really impatient and who can benefit from the tool already now, then I will recommend you to join our development repository on GitHub. And the repository really contains bleeding edge models, and therefore it is semi-private. This basically means that everyone can join the repository, but we want to know who has the access. And if you are interested in, in, in joining, then you can apply for access on this link right here. And, or you can simply send us an email. I will make sure that these presentations are available along with the webcast recording in case you did not have time to write down the link. And also, if you want to know more about Anybody Technology, you can go and check out our website, anybodytech.com, where you can find different events, special dates, and also a full publication list of studies using the Anybody Modeling System. You can also go and check out anyscript.org, which is our community website for people using Anybody. And here you'll find multiple online resources as our wiki page, several blog posts, and links to our repository sites. It's also here our forum is located and you can go and ask questions and get help from fellow Anybody users. I would also like to point your attention for an upcoming online course. Our South and Central America distributor research and performance biomechanics are hosting an introduction course live via Zoom, which consists of three times two hour sessions. And the first session will be on November 30. The course language is in English, but there is live Spanish support. So if you are interested, then go and follow this link right here and register for the course. Last but not least, if you have any questions or you want to meet up or you are interested in getting a trial version of our software, then please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. And if you have any follow-up question regarding this webcast or any of the previous ones, then please feel free to send me an email at ki at anybodytech.com or simply reach out to me through LinkedIn. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and then we will read out a few of the questions from the audience. <laughs>